Explicity Cast from Explicity. Egypt's experiments in prison lectures are full of contradictions. In the 1960s, Kamal Abdel Nasser prisons were home to both Islamists and communists. And members of the two movements recorded their experience so differently that you start to wonder how truthfully they were. It sometimes feels like they were deliberately attempting to frustrate any understanding of what prison was like at that time. But their dissimilarity is reflection of their individuality rather than their honesty. There can be no universal acknowledged truth when each of prisoners goes through such different experience and feels such a personal pain. Truth demand consents and proof, but prison writing rely in personal narrative alone. Any untruth or inconsistency can be explained away as the work of prison itself. And when the story doesn't make sense or its plausibility is called into questions, the writer-narrator still has honesty in their sight. Contradiction and error can't be helped when prison puts people under such extreme pressures. Then there is a dead weight of ideology that drags on this writings. Prison lectures has always played a part in political conflict in the same way that prison itself. In the mind of the political prisoners is unavoidably features of the political struggle. Most Arabic prison lectures I have read has been produced by political prisoners for whom writing is just an extension of their activism. It stops them from going crazy or keeps their soul from dying while they wait for the bitter future that they are going to build with their party or organization when they get out. Or if they are writing after the fact, then they do so to inscribe the experience of their movement on the walls of history, to make a scratch, however small, on the towering facade of power and the narrative it imposes. So, the art story of whatever's written about isn't what matters to the imprisoned activist writer. The important thing is the documentary content of the text and what it can do to serve the literary political cause. But documents and testimonies aren't lectures and are certainly not art. And if art has a documentary value, it's only secondary. A document attempts to explain, to educate the public. Literature exists into itself. Its essence lies in its singularity, not its expository abilities. And it's from work of literature that writers learn their craft. In work of literature, form is central, indeed. Form and content are one. That's what makes a work. In documents and testimonies of imprisonment, content dominates, and form is just means to an end. Today, I'm excited to be speaking with Ahmed Naji a writer who spent two years in a prison in Egypt for writing what the authorities judged to be objectionable material. But while Ahmed Naji was in prison, he discovered literature. It's an amazing story of a person who finds magic and hope in the unlikely environs of the library of a stereotypical prison, a pestilential and dank hovel, one biscuit short of hell. But before I talk to him, I thought it might be useful to get some context going here. So maybe a little primer about Egyptian literature first. Modern Egyptian literature began to flourish in the early 20th century, say right up to the end of the 1940s, as writers started to break away from traditional Arabic literary forms, such as classical Arab poetry with specific meter and rhyming schemes, the popular ghazals are one such example. It was during that time that the author Taha Hussein, often called the Dean of Arabic Literature, challenged classical literary norms when he introduced a more accessible style of prose. The next decades 
saw the birth of a cultural renaissance with the overthrow of King Farouk and the monarchy in 1952 and the beginning of the Republic. This gave rise to a lot of the expression of the day, and that's about when Naguib Mahfouz happened. He went on to win the Nobel Prize in 1988, and he brought world attention to Egyptian literature. Now, as with all cultural forms, one decade tends to build on the previous, and the successive decades have seen social realism, pioneering books like Woman at Point Zero, about the struggles of women in Egyptian society, and writers explain the challenges of contemporary life in Egypt. There was the growth of female and feminist voices, and of course the influences from the Arab Spring. Importantly, there has been the growth in contribution to literature from the Egyptian diaspora. Speaking of which, check out the episode with Omar el Akkad, a truly talented Egyptian-American author. I found his writing in a literary magazine and invited him on the podcast. I found Ahmed Najid's writing online too, and I was fascinated by his story and his work, and we tracked him down to his home in the United States. Ahmed's latest book, Rotten Evidence, is the story of his time in prison, about how he discovered literature, the writer in himself, and, importantly, the reality of protest. I found these lines he wrote captured the essence of that sense of protest against censorship and being jailed for alleged obscenity. Here's the quote. James Joyce, who swore to express himself with the greatest degree of freedom possible and never to serve home, fatherland, or church, said a writer had three weapons, silence, exile, and cunning. Well, Joyce... They put me in prison and all I had left was laughter and rage. I like quotable lines from books and in this case I was tripping over them in the first few pages. Such is the captivating prose of my guest today. And now here he is joining me from his home in Las Vegas. Ahlan Beek, Ahmed Naji, welcome to the literary city. Ahlan Beek, thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, the pleasure is entirely mine. And let me plunge right in. Now, you were sentenced to a term in prison because you were found guilty of gross violation of public decency. Did you grossly violate public decency? Uh, officially, yes. I have an official government paper that says so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm officially ex-criminal and, and, and all this attitudes. But yeah, the story starts in, in 2014. I wrote uh, my second novel, Using, no Using Live. And um, after it was published, a chapter of it was published at Akbar uh, al-Adab, uh, which is a weekly literature uh, magazine. And as you just mentioned, someone reads this chapter and went to the police station and accused me of disturbing public morality and hurting his feeling and said that when he read uh, this part, he got like a blood pressure and a heart attack and so on. Oh, how clinical. What happened after um, a year of a trial, uh, a court find me guilty, another one find me not guilty. It ended up with this called uh, find me guilty and sentenced me for two uh, years. Um, and then um, I was out of the prison in 2017, the uh, situation in Egypt was uh, getting more and more uh, dangerous and uh, tight. Uh, also, as an ex-prisoner, I was under uh, surveillance and censorship. So it was um, kind of impossible to continue uh, working and writing there. But also, I was banned from traveling. I was banned from leaving the country. So it took me a year and a half to be able to leave, and, uh, leave the country finally in 2018. So the ordeal was more than just the two years in prison. Yeah, it's 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 the longest struggle that continue until now. Like um, it's been five years. I haven't been to Egypt. Uh, it's not ever safe for me to go there. Why? Um, because you might be arrested uh, again, or yeah, of of sure, you might be arrested again. You can also, they can also let you enter the country, but not leaving the country uh, again. Mm -hmm. um, right. Uh, there has been 
um, like like many Egyptian writers uh, now living in exile, not only me, right, right. writers and, sure. and so on. So, yeah, it's been five years. Um, like even my mother passed away and I couldn't be there with her or visiting her. So, yeah. I'm so sorry. Thank you. It's a continuing struggle, uh, not for me, but I would say for, for millions of Egyptians um, under uh, this regime. And more part your elbow. Now, to quote you, I found these lines that you wrote, rebel against the contradictions of religion, fantasy, and human morality. Do you? Um, n not not that much. Like it's it, uh, religion wasn't in in my focus that much. But I think this is changing now after moving here to United States. Also, I found it here. Like I'm discovering, as you said, I'm discovering like the metaphysic of of the religion here, and uh, it's it, it's so inspiring and inspire me. How? Like one one of the. I just like start writing in English lately. Mm -hmm. So I'm moving from Arabic to writing in English. Mm -hmm. And one of the first short stories that I found myself writing in English was basically about Las Vegas, but also it's mixing Islamic metaphysic fantasy to, to Las Vegas uh, urban scene. Uh, like, Was that the essay about the mosque? Yeah, it was this this short story about. Uh, I've the, read yeah. it. I've read it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was this short story about uh, the mosque and Sra and Marag and and all this stuff. Um, because also, like I like as I'm was telling you, I'm I'm I wasn't that much into religion, but I come here, and you start to discover. Like for example, I would go to an events here. And after the event, a woman will come and she can't with me and will introduce herself as she's part of this um, association or or or, uh, or organization for Arab uh, Arab Muslim writers. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, for me, from where I come from, I'm 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 secular. There is other Islamic literature and other Islamic group, but I have no connection with that. But finally, you arrive here and you discover, at the end of the day, your name is Ahmed. So so it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You will be seen as Muslim and sure. part of that. So I become curious, and and this curiosity led me to 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 a lot of discoveries and also a lot of fun and created the funny stories like that one, gotshow.com, gotshow.com. I enjoyed that story. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to move on to how you discovered literature in prison. But first, I'd like to go to the day that you were being brought to prison and you were distracted by the art on the walls, the murals. And you wrote this very compelling sentence. I tend to experience art viscerally. I feel it involuntarily in my digestive system all the way down to my urinary tract, and the result can be pain, pleasure, or a cramp, agony, or delight. Yeah, I was, I was shocked that when I entered the prison, usually when you have an imaginary picture of the admission, which is like a gray wall, yes. uh, a dark areas, and so on. But when I entered this prison, I found that all the prison wall from outside and inside is covered by this horrible, horrible kitchen painting. <laughs> like you are in the prison and, and in face, and in your face on the wall, there is a giant, um, a painting of Hawaiian island. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It's, it's thing is like when I start asking around. So when I start asking around, I discover like 10 years ago, there was this uh, famous Egyptian artist who like got involved in, in, in this corrupted case and was sentenced for five years. And while his time, he teached other prisoners who are painter, like a wall and house painter. Cool. And they started to decorate the whole prison. And the warden and the police officer saw that this is something nice because now when journalists or something come to check out in the prison, it appeared oh, yeah. to be beautiful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And this set the stage for your narrative for the next bit. Now, uh, let's give past how bad prison was. I mean, uh, no one will assume that prison is anything but dangerous and stinking. But you discovered literature there, specifically literary cellmates, 
One guy was reading Mrs. Uh, Anwar Sadat's uh, Woman of Egypt. Another was reading Taha Hussein's with Abu El Ala Al Mari in his prison. When I entered the prison, and I was in cell with more than 60 people, so it's more than 60 people living in the same space. And because there is nothing else you can do, all of them are reading. I get it. So you are surrounded by those people who never opened, some of them never opened the book before entering the prison, but now they are reading and they are discovering the enjoyment of reading and lectures. And personally, since I was 19 years old, I was graduated uh, from, from mass communication journalism. So I have been working on journalism since I was 19 or 20 years. And I have been working on, on this weekly literature magazine. So I always, all my life was surrounded by writers and artists and critics. So I discovered when I was in prison that I discovered another world of literature. Like it was my first time to communicate with regular or normal readers. Like, you know, readers who are not writers, who are not artists, just reading to pass time. And their impression and comments on what they read was so inspiring for me. And, and I opened it. Like I remember very well, like one of them in my first uh, couple of weeks, and one of them, we were talking and they were like, oh, so you are a writer, your family is going to bring more new ice books and so on. I told them, yes, what kind of book would you like to, to, to read? And what did they want to read? Two of them actually were very anxious about Dostoevsky. Really? They were like, oh, could you bring us more Dostoevsky? And I was shocked. I was like, who want to read Dostoevsky while he was in, while he in the prison? <laughs> and I was like, did you read Dostoevsky? They were like, yeah, he's so fun. He's so funny. He's hilarious <laughs> funny. And my first impression was like, Dostoevsky funny? How? And I asked them, and one of them was like, yes, in all of his novel and the story, there is a clown character. That's true. Or most of his novel plot is built on, on contradiction and misunderstanding. <laughs> nice. And I was like, yes, he, he's right. And for, for this reader, yeah, this Fisky was funny. It's hilarious. But, and, and this was my first time to hear someone call this Fisky writing funny. Because usually, as an intellectual, when we talk about this Fisky, we talk about, oh, this Fisky and novel in 19th century and <laughs> uh, the complexity of human character and so on. <laughs> so it was like discovering a new face of, of literature. And this was happening. In the meantime, also, I was questioning myself. I'm, you know, like, yeah, I was writing and I already been writing and publishing since I was 23 years old. But also, I wasn't considered myself as a true, uh, as a writer. I mean, I was a journalist. Mm -hmm. I was a, f a film documentary sure. maker, other things. But suddenly you are in prison because of your writing. And you start to question yourself. Does it worth it? Some people will come and ask me this question. If you know before writing the novel that it will lead you to prison, will you write it? And I was mm -hmm. thinking on that. Until the accident uh, with Zarini source uh, happened. You know, in the book, I don't use names because I used to live mm -hmm. with these people. I respect them and their privacy. So I don't use names or any details that expose them. But there was this guy with us, um, and the nickname is Rhinosaurus, and he's so corrupted, like, the government accused mm -hmm. him of stealing $400 million. He's saying, <laughs> no, they are just 200 millions. <laughs> <laughs> when he first did all the scheme, like, he made all the company paper and all the official paper under his father name, who's like a very old guy, 81 years old. Mm. So when the government arrested, was looking for him, they first arrested his father and then they arrested him. So both the son and the father was together in the same cell. And, wow. and this guy, like I watched him one time, his father got a heart attack and faint. And he was standing, like finishing his cigarettes. And everyone was rushing to help his father. And he was just like smoking his cigarette to me. And one day I woke up at night and, and went to the bathroom and I found this guy, Sarinosaurus, this monster, corrupted monster, crying. 
with tears. Mm. I was shocked. I was like, are you okay? Is something happening with your case? Is this, did you receive bad news? And he was like, no, 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 no. It's, it's not sad. It's not sad. I was like, so what's wrong? And then he asked me, have you ever read this novel called In My Heart, A Hebrew Gear? <laughs> and this is a very um, uh, romantic novel. It's not even romantic. There is a new trend in, in Arabic literature called Sufism, uh, Suf- Roma- Sufism, romanticism. So mm-hmm. it's mixed romance was with, with sufism was with religion and it's usually for teen- teenagers and i was like no i didn't read this novel and he was like oh my god you have to read it <laughs> it is it's it is squeezed my heart <laughs> it broke my heart it's just like i left it on my bed because when i i look to the cover I remember sentence and paragraph from it, so I started crying. <laughs> and I was shocked. Like, this guy has a dead heart. <laughs> um, but suddenly, a novel, a writing, is having this huge effect and impact on him. And, and I was shocked. I was like, what is that? What is, what, is, what is this hidden power inside literary and writing that could reach out and affect such creature that that we even could question if he's a human being or not <laughs> <laughs> this, this is hilarious but moving on i'd like to talk about uh, arabic literature specifically two icons of egyptian yeah. literature that i wanted to ask you about tahsein and the person that he imagined his time in prison with al mari by the way, I was looking for the book that you referenced, which is Ta Hussein writing about his time in prison with Al Mari. I looked everywhere, yes. but I haven't been able to find it on it. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think there will be an English translation for it. This is like also a very oh. old one that it was written and published in thirties. Right. Uh, but Al Mari, I'm sure there is different translation English translation of Al Mari poetry. Uh, that I have found. Yeah, I mean, I found some of those, but yeah. I haven't found. Taha, the one that you mentioned, Taha Hussein's book, no, uh, In Prison with al Mari. I'm, yes. I'm not able to find it. Uh, I read that Taha Hussein was um, a pioneer and he sort of uh, redefined Arabic literature in his time. Is that the case? Yes, of course. Uh, Taha Hussein playing, played a fundamental part in, in, in Arabic culture. And his influence seems to be lasting. Whenever yeah. I read... Egyptian writers. Now, I'm not talking about giants like Said and Mahfouz. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about writers who get published in literary magazines of late. I get a strong sense of the literary, of classical literature, which is why your description of finding literary treasures with your cellmates seemed completely credible to me. It's, it seemed like, yes, I understand. That's what you'd expect if you go into an e- Egyptian prison, people reading literature. <laughs> now, <laughs> so does the average Egyptian have a strong sense of literature? Uh, there is uh, appreciation. Uh, this is changing in the last decade after Dubai rising. But in, in 60s and, and 80s and 90s, most of publishing was happening from the government. You know, like Egypt, starting from 60s, invested heavily in culture uh, uh, institute and in publishing institute. What happened that this situation will give the writers a freedom because you don't have an obligation towards the market. Uh, so it gives you also a freedom to focus on, on, on the literary and artistic values. Uh, yes, the business of art having to have patrons and not customers. Yeah, you're right. You are right. You, you nail it. You nail it right. Yeah. And here I was romanticizing that every high school kid in Egypt learned literature. I was at Zitishism, actually the worst literature. Oh, no. Like, yeah, like literally, oh, I, was, I, was, I was writing about an, an poet who lived in, in 50s and 60s. And he's very romantic. It's all of his poems about, about love and very tender. One of his poems, he teaches kids in high school. And when I read, like, they choose his worst poem, <laughs> you know, <laughs> his worst <laughs> poem. <laughs> That's funny. Now, we cannot discuss Egyptian literature and 
not mention Nagi Mahfuz. You write that you could hardly see yourself as reading Mahfuz's mm-hmm. Cairo trilogy as an adult. Why? Is he preferred reading for the emerging intellect? Or did I get it wrong? No, no, no. No, I, I, what I say is that uh, I was lucky that I read Cairo trilogy, uh, his three novels, when I was young. I, I reread some of his old work because sometimes um, the officer will not allow me a new book. You know, like my family will visit, they will bring me the new book, and the deal will be, oh, I can't let this box enter until the high-ranking uh, uh, security officer have to read and approve it. So sometimes I don't have things to read. And when you don't have things to read, it's 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 a horrible time because you suddenly feel the heaviness of, of the time passing. You are just sitting there looking to the clock. And, and once the time passes, so the night comes and you will be able to sleep. So, and he will say, oh, go to the prison library. And the prison, they will have like small library. And in this library, it was full of old and classic book. And part of it was Nagim Mahfouz. So in most of these cases, when I don't have book, I will go and, and, and re-enjoy even reading uh, his work. Uh, so yeah, no, I'm, I'm in the opposite. I, I love him. Oh, that's good to know. So there's another thing that we cannot not discuss in the context of Egyptian literature, and that is the city of Cairo. You know, I have oh. uh, I've never been to Cairo. I'd love to go. And you li- really enjoy it. It's also getting cheap these days. Really? It's another thing that's good to know. So about Cairo, in your uh, uh, previous book, Using Life, there's this foreword in which you mentioned about Cairo, a miserable, hideous, filthy, rotten, mm-hmm. dark, oppressive, besieged, lifeless, enervating, polluted, overcrowded, impoverished, angry, smoke-filled, simmering, humid, trashy, shitty, choleric, anemic mess of a city. Yeah. Well, in many great cities of the developing world, we might call that Tuesday. Tuesday? Yeah, perfect name. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so tell me, Cairo. It seems to inspire something literary, if not poetic. I read this wonderful book. Uh, it's a collection of essays uh, called The Literary Life of Cairo, edited by Samia Mehrez. Yeah, amazing, right? Amazing, Professor. Yes, I know her. You know, in, the, in that book, I was particularly taken up by this essay written by Edward Said, and uh, it's titled... Mm. Homage to a belly dancer. I remember the article that you mentioned by Edward Said. He was talking about Haya Karyoka. Right. If you remember in the article, he's talking about how he, when he was in high school in Victoria College, mm-hmm. he would escape school in the morning to go with his friends to this nightclub. So the nightclub can't allow them to enter because they are young. They are not 19. But in the morning, it's time for Billy Dancer for training and rehearsal. So it's like they are attending the Billy Dancer show. <laughs> <laughs> nice to associate Edward Said with that. Young kid can go into nightclub, but he knows that he could work in the morning. In the <laughs> That's true. To see That's the true. Now, you wrote Rotten Evidence in Arabic, and I read it in English and enjoyed it thoroughly. It means the translation was brilliant. What were the challenges? What about the idiom? Did it travel? Yeah, so we made, I think, both of us, me and Catherine Holtz, the translator, and Daniel Gambini, as editor, we did a very interesting job in this book. So before moving here to United States, I really didn't care that much about translation. Like, I trust the translator. They, they love the book, and, and it's their job. So the deal, what happened that um, Catherine made the translation and I told Daniel Gambini, the editor, when you receive the translation, deal with it as it's a, an, an English written book and come back with comments and, and suggestion to me. So, so when Daniel's come with me, we totally changed the book. Like first, there is more than three or 4,000 words in the English translation that didn't exist in the Arabic. They were written, I wrote them in English for the English readers. We cut, we cut 
uh, some parts and that exist in the Arabic, but we found like it will not work in in, in perfect way in English. We even sometimes change it. Uh, the style, the narration style. Like in Arabic, for example, there is a tradition, there is a very uh, uh, literary trick that in the same paragraph that you could jump from the first narration to the second narration or the third narration. But when you do this in English, it doesn't make any sense and it loses its beauty. Yeah. So we change it that, for example. Even the structure of the book, you know, like the whole book is written in fragments and how this fragment organized in the English version is different from the Arabic version. That's most interesting. Talk to me about the idiom. There is also some funny details because Catherine Holtz, my translator, she's British mm -hmm. and Daniel Gambini is American. Okay. So, for example, I remember a funny thing that um, there is a there is a nickname for prison guards in Egypt, and when Catherine tried to translate it, she she used the word screws. And Daniel was like, "What is that?" <laughs> um, and she was like, "Oh, it's a British nickname for prison warden and prison guards." <laughs> yes, that's right. I was like, "I don't. I, it's my first time to see this word. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense <laughs> yes, here, because yes. here the nicknames that they will have for them would be something like they will call them CO2." Correction officer. <laughs> but also, there was this always contradiction between the British English and the American English. <laughs> it's interesting uh, that that's the problem you had with idiom, British and American. <laughs> so, what do you do now? What I am do, I'm now a writer in exile. Mm -hmm. uh, I live in the beautiful, sunny, hot Las Vegas. After I arrived here and I found myself an exiled writer, I found usually there is two, two, two ways to continue here. To continue living here, but writing in Arabic and writing about Egypt. You know, like as an exiled writer, you live in a country that you don't know anything about, but your mind and your heart in another country. And I was like, no, I can't do this. And the other that I found also some exiled writer will come here and they are ready to give the American Institute and American audience, what they want, what they are looking for. Um, and playing the identity hat. It's like, oh, today I'm Arabic writer. Today I'm Muslim writer. Today I'm brown writer. Mm -hmm. And so on. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, no, I don't want to do that. I want, And I was lucky because I ended in Las Vegas. I think if I ended in East Coast in New York, things would be different. I agree. Um, but I ended in, in Las Vegas and in West, and in the desert. And for me, it was a very bizarre and, and, and weird and strange place. Like I go to the desert, what they call it here, the desert. And I was like, this is not desert. Your idea about <laughs> geography and natural is 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 is, is wrong, <laughs> because it's just like would be a mountain full of greens, <laughs> but it's rocky mountain. <laughs> there is no sand. I like no sand. But then, yeah. But this will lead you to question uh, uh, everything, and Christy is moving you and. To find an answer, you you don't find an answer for this question, but you found the stories. Mm -hmm. And after five years, I feel the West spirit is is getting under my skin. So my work is becoming more and more attached to Vegas nowadays and attached to to the desert spirit. Do you see the two years you spent in prison as the low point of your life? As the low point of my life, uh, no. No, it, it 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 was hard. It was hard and 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 extreme, um, and painful, of course. And I don't wash it for anyone, uh, the Egyptian prison or any other prison. But um, no, I don't think it's 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 a low point of my life. So when you were in prison, mm -hmm. what were your thoughts that this will end one day and you'll come out? It's going to be better. What what were you thinking? Yeah, I mean, we in, in a prison, we always say to each other, we are getting out. There is a day no one would continue to live here. One day you will get out. And we will always tell each other, when we get out, we have to take a revenge. 
And revenge is not by like killing someone or hunting down someone. The revenge is to live every day as like we will say, well, every day in prison, we have to take a revenge of every day by enjoying 10 days. And and this is something that I'm I'm trying to do always. It's true. There's there is always the promise of tomorrow. The, yep. But speaking of wish, I'd like to end on a more facetious note and quote to you my favorite Arabic proverb. Bukra fil mishmish. Yes, you are right. <laughs> Ahmed Naji. Thank you so much for being my guest today on The Literary City. Thank you so much. This has been like one of the funnest and enjoyable interviews that I ever had. Really, really, I love it. And uh, I'm looking forward to listening it and to listen to more of your amazing episodes. You've been listening to my guest, Ahmed Naji, the author of Rotten Evidence, Reading and Writing in an Egyptian Prison. You'll find a link in the podcast description to where you can find his book. And I'll be back with What's That Word? That fun segment where we look at words and phrases that we use all the time, but never stop to think about right after this. back with What's That Word? And here is my co-host. Hello. My name is Pranati, but you can call me P. That's P with an A. And I repeat, not another E. Wow, that was emphatic. Why? Are the people defying your diktat? One tried today. <laughs> tried what? Calling me P, but with another E. And? Well, let's just say I was not the one who had an accident. Chilling. Yeah, he thought it was a great joke. And he's the only one who thought that up, right? Yeah, I guess. So, so I take it this guy is off the friends list? Worse, I friend zoned him. Poor guy. Well, everything today is chilling. Yes, it is. Your interview with Ahmad Naji. I mean, fascinating story about his discovery of literature in prison. Hey, I know you have an interest in uh, Nagi Mahfouz. You went to Cairo, didn't you? Yes, magic place. And hmm. uh, I bought Mahfouz there in a bookshop way off the tourist path. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and I totally get what you were saying about Arab literature. I know, there's a, there's a soulfulness to that uh, culture and therefore the literature. Thanks for that monologue, by the way. I mean, it's interesting to know all about uh, the history of Arabic literature. Well, I'm glad you found it useful. Okay, P with an A, what's that word? I had something in mind to discuss, but I'll save it for next time. Oh, lovely. Okay, so that's all for today, folks. <laughs> Very funny. No, no, not so fast. I have something else. Uh, of course you do. Okay, go ahead. Well, when you were closing out, you said something in mm -hmm. Arabic to Ahmad Naji, and you guys laughed. Um, a mm -hmm. proverb, was it? Something mm -hmm. mish -mish sounded very funny. <laughs> ah, yes, it's a proverb. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. Arabic proverbs. Hmm. <laughs> and starting with mishmish. -mish. Sure. Okay, so the one I used, this one goes, Bukrafil mishmish. What does it mean? Well, the literal translation of it is, there will be apricots tomorrow. <laughs> How delightful. There will be apricots tomorrow. What does it mean, though? You know, like everywhere east of the Mediterranean, no one ever says what they mean. And whatever <laughs> one says is fraught with traps. <laughs> and? Basically, it means there will not be apricots today. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> but tell me more, please. Okay. So, you know, no apricots tomorrow is basically describes the situation where someone is promising something that seems unlikely to happen in the near future or might happen in too far in the future. You know, in a sarcastic or dismissive manner, implying that the promise is vague or unfulfillable. You know, similar to saying, when pigs fly or it will be a cold day in hell, right? <laughs> yeah, still delightful. In mm. essence, the proverb suggests that the promise being made will only come true in an ideal or unreal scenario. It's a way to express skepticism or doubt about the likelihood of a promise being fulfilled. So what's the closest English equivalent as a proverb, I mean? Tomorrow never comes. Mm, that sounds about right. But what's the etymology of this phrase in Arabic? 
Oh, well, with Proverbs in general, the etymology can be challenging to uh, definitively trace because so much of it comes from just culture and homilies, you know what I'm saying? It's, but uh, its use is consistent in its um, metaphorical sense of making far off or vague promises. Why apricots? <laughs> the season for harvesting and consuming apricots is somewhat short. And the fruit is highly perishable. So promising something to happen, Bukhra fil mishmish, implies that it will occur at a distant or unlikely time, like saying when the mishmishes are in season. Right? <laughs> so the phrase suggests an event that's far off or vague or maybe entirely implausible. <laughs> How rude. It tomorrow is. never comes, so I will promise I'll do it tomorrow. Well, you know, you were asking about other applications of the term, weren't you? Yes, I was. Right. Okay. It just occurred to me. I remember there's this line in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. It goes, jam tomorrow and jam yesterday, but never jam today. <laughs> that's funny. I mean, that's exactly Bukra filmishmish. Yes, it is. And I remember a sign over a bar in a pub that I used to frequent in Shepparton. You know, uh, that's a London suburb. Uh, it, the, the sign read, free beer tomorrow. <laughs> that's rude and downright disappointing. But say, do you know any more Arabic proverbs? A few. Okay, do one more, please. Another food one? Sure. Okay, here goes. One day honey, one day onions. <laughs> Now, what does that mean? <laughs> I guess one must take the rough with the smooth honey <laughs> Yeah, I suppose. So, but what's with you and Proverbs? Why do you like them so much? I don't like them so much. I can't stand most of them. <laughs> but why? I mean, even in the episode with Tenzin Dicky, you threw a proverb at her. Clearly, I read them, yes. There's such a great window to a culture. That's why, you know, all their value systems and such. And what I like most about is the humor in Proverbs, because Proverbs are mostly about stupid people doing stupid things. <laughs> That's true, actually. Okay, but before we go, one more Arabic proverb for the road, please. All right, let me think. Oh, here's one. He married a monkey for the money. The money went. The monkey stayed a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the English equivalent of that? Uh, I guess it would be, you know, uh, as you make your bed, so you must lie on it. <laughs> All these are totally funny. But my new favorite is Bukrafil Mishmish, and I'm going to use it on all my friends. Have a blast. And on that note... Bye. <laughs> And that is our show. I'd like to thank my guest, Ahmed Naji, and my co-host, Pranati P with an A, Madhav, and all of you for being here and for listening and for all those lovely messages that you keep sending us. Now, before you go, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, but please leave some likes and comments wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. Apparently, these things help us a great deal. So until we meet again, have a wonderful week. I'm Ramji Chandran, and this is The Literary City. <laughs>